You know, a lot of people have talked about, and we hear it so much in the on the national scene, of these bills that are being written, and sometimes 2,000 pages. Well, let's just pass it and we'll read it later. You know, mm -hmm. we've heard that so much from Speaker, when she was the Speaker Pelosi, we'll pass this bill and read it later. You know, the American people are not as dumb as, as Washington thinks we are, I don't think. But I want to speak for just a moment of why can you not author a bill that pertains to two or three pages at the maximum, no more than 30 pages, without all this port barrel spending in it, where all this money you're talking about is having to be funneled to. Well, if you had a limited government, if the federal government was, was within the means of the Constitution, you'd never have a 2,000-page bill because there's nothing they can do that will require 2,000 pages of legislation. Everything ought to be small, a little short bill that they would pass because their authority is limited up there. When you see a 2,000-page Obamacare bill, 2,700 pages, whatever it was, or a 1,200-page Dodd-Frank bill that's going to take over what banks do and, and complicate our lives for no good reason whatsoever, it's an overreach of the federal government. There should be no bills. Anything that comes out like that should be an automatic no for our conservatives, saying, no, I'm not going to, I'm going to do everything I can to fight this. And if Republicans would quit compromising and allow these things to happen, we would stop every bit of it. They can't get these things done unless the Republicans go along with it. That's the point I'm trying to make in this campaign. All this big government we've had did not get turned back in 2011, last year. It continued and even got bigger. It got bigger. And it couldn't have happened unless Republicans in the U.S. House went along with it. Those moderate Republicans, Alan Nunley included, went along and compromised, and this stuff is still in place. The 66 to 86 guys, they're the ones that would say, no, we're not doing any kind of bill that's like that. And what a breach of your duty to not even read things, to have things come up and pass it. That appropriations bill I mentioned in uh, uh, December, that trillion-dollar appropriations bill that keeps all this big government funded, that keeps Obamacare funded, that keeps Planned Parenthood funded. Alan Nunley announced that he was supporting it. When they actually voted on it that afternoon, he missed the vote, but he announced his support from it for it. They had less, I think, about 18 hours to read that, and it was, I believe, 1,200 pages long. Did that mean they read it? They did not read it. These congressmen didn't step all night and read that bill. They just passed it. The leadership put it out there, and they just said, we want you to vote for it. And these moderate Republicans who follow to do whatever the leadership tells them to do, like Alan Nunley, they just vote on it. They don't know what's in it. They just do it. I want to talk about the salary of a U.S. congressman. This came up recently at a, a public meeting. And the salary is somewhere, I believe, if I researched right, $175,000. All right, if you serve in Congress and you decide in, say, four years, eight years, you decide that you will not seek re-election and you retire, will you retire with the same salary? No, I, I don't think anybody in government, factually now, I don't think anybody in government retires after a short period of time with that kind of money. I don't even think Congress has pushed that that far yet. But they do after a short period of time, they are eligible for a salary. And I think after 10 years, it's locked in and they get a certain 50% or something. But no, that's not right. They shouldn't get a retirement after a short period of time. Who does? Do you? I don't. Nobody in probably watching this TV program does. Congress shouldn't be able to do anything that ordinary Americans can't do. And they shouldn't be able to stay up there long enough to get a retirement in. I believe a congressman or senator shouldn't be up there over 12 years. I believe that's one of the abuses of the system. They just try to do everything they can to stay and stay and stay. And America, during that period of time, during these last several decades, with all these long, long tenures in Congress, has just gotten deeper and deeper in debt and got bigger and bigger government. I think we need a constitutional amendment to limit congressional terms to 12 years. That would be uh, six terms in the House, two years each, or two terms in the Senate, six years each. After 12 years, they need to go home. That's the end of the road for anybody. Nobody up there is indispensable. They like to think they are, but they're not. We need to turn that House and turn that Senate over and over and get good people coming in and coming in with new ideas and elect conservative, real Republicans, real conservative Republicans who want to limit government, and that's the best way to do it. These long-standing so-called conservatives that we've sent up there, they're just big government people, and, and they compromise, and it continues and continues and continues. You know, the one question I'm sure a lot of people who might watch this would say would be, you say you are conservative. 
uh, your opponents say they're a conservative, and they say they will go and make a difference, why should we believe that you are really a conservative Republican? Well, I'm convicted that way. I hope people can see that that are, are watching us on TV right now. But, <clears throat> but one of the ways to know this is, what has a person done? A person that's been in government and politics over the years, and they always sail back in, they get reelected, and never have had any bumps in the road, that really means that they've never done anything controversial. They've always done whatever everybody else wants to do, and it never is to do controversial things, to cut government back. To really reduce spending is a controversial thing. People aren't going to get what they've been getting. You have to make the choices to say, hey, it's got to stop. When you do that, it's going to be some unhappy people. The people that continue to get elected year after year, election after election, they probably avoided this controversy. The people that you can count on that will do some tough things are people that have done tough things before, and it's cost them. Y'all don't mind telling your viewers. I've had people work against me in elections in offices I've had and I've lost before because I did the right thing. I represented the entire community. And a lot of people don't want that. And if you do some tough things, you're going to have people working against you. If a person's never, never faced that, if they've never had a bump in the road, if they've never lost an election, nothing bad's ever happened, they probably have been totally non-controversial. That means they haven't made the tough choices that are required. That is a good measure. Also, a good, uh, totally a perfect measure is somebody's record. If somebody's gone to Congress and they've compromised with every single compromise, they've joined every single compromise that has come up that has kept the debt ceiling raised, big government in place, Obamacare funded, Planned Parenthood funded, more money spent this year than last, all of those compromises, they've joined every one of them, you know they're not a conservative. When they campaign on meaningless votes that we discussed earlier that don't count for anything and they try to hide the ones that really counted, that really funded all this stuff, you know they're not conservative. They're just moderates up there and they're keeping this system in place. Before we close out the interview, there is an issue that is at the forefront of everything right now, and that's the contraceptive issue that is being mandated by Obamacare. And uh, it goes against the religious freedoms of some of the uh, denominations in this country. There is a big uprising right now throughout the nation on this. What are your views on it? Well, what you're talking about, the Obama administration has required, I believe, Catholic hospitals and Catholic medical services to require contraceptives to be uh, dispensed or uh, uh, that kind of uh, parenthood planning, those kind of things that Catholics are opposed to. Well, they have no authority. The Obama, Obama administration, nobody in the federal government and has the authority to tell any of us anything to do like that. There's no authority in the Constitution for them to do that. Now, the U.S. Supreme Court looked at a case back in the fall where a teacher had been fired because she didn't follow the doctrines of a certain church, and that was a church school. And it had really nothing to do with her teaching ability. It had more to do with her doctrinal beliefs. Well, the Supreme Court, by I think a 5-4 decision, said, or maybe it was 6-3, said that she could be fired, that no government could require her, that's no discrimination there, no government could require her to continue to be employed. Well, the same thing is true about this contraceptive issue or anything else. The federal government has no authority to tell me and you what to do about anything. They might collect some taxes from us. They might uh, regulate a few things dealing with the issues that they are able to regulate or deal with, interstate commerce, actual interstate commerce, things like that. But everything else, Ann, is left to the states. The states in the Tenth Amendment are given control over everyday life. What kind of hospitals, what the hospitals do, what schools do, what businesses can do or not do, that's left to state regulation. The Tenth Amendment makes that clear, and that's what the founders wanted. They didn't want a massive federal government telling everybody everything to do. We left that beginning in the 30s, and we went just way off the chart in the 60s, and now it's skyrocketing under the current administration. We need conservatives up there that will fight for the Constitution to write this thing, or we're going to fail as a country. One quick thing, I don't know if we have time, but if we do, this big government and all this debt eventually, and it's going to be sooner rather than later, I'm afraid very soon, soon other countries are going to quit taking the dollar as the world reserve currency to pay for things that are paid for out in the world. When that happens, the dollar will have to be exchanged for some other currency they come up with in order to buy oil, in order to buy the things we like to buy. 
When that happens, we're going to become poorer overnight because we can't print these dollars. It's nothing but a piece of paper and a promise. They're not going to manufacture and give us resources or manufactured goods in exchange for worthless pieces of paper. They're going to say there's too much debt there, that paper's not any good anymore, and you're going to have to get another currency to buy this with. And when we exchange a dollar for this other currency, it's going to be a low, low exchange, and we won't be able to buy what we're buying right now. And that's coming very, very soon. It's on our horizon. Is that not a step towards socialistic government? And it's a step towards our economy failing and government taking over a lot of things. There's going to be some real disruption in our economy when this happens. And there's talk in the world right now about it. This isn't just a theory. There's a lot of countries in the world talking about not taking the dollar anymore for, for the goods that they're selling. Well, we know you have a short time to cover a lot of territory. And I want to give you an opportunity to speak to the voters here in the area on behalf of your candidacy for the Republican nomination. Well, I'd just like to say that uh, the Republican primary is March the 13th. It's coming up very quickly. We've uh, sent a congressman up there. He campaigned and said, Alan Nunley said he would reduce government spending, that he would lower, lower uh, the government interference in our life, stop Obamacare. He said all of these things. But he's gone up there and joined every single compromise that has kept Obamacare, Planned Parenthood in place, Obama's big government, all Obama's, Obama's agencies raised the debt ceiling by $2.1 trillion. No real spending cuts in return. The government's going to spend more money this year than last. Nothing has happened. Nothing has happened. These compromises have done nothing but keep big government in place. If the people of this district will send me up there, I will fight for limited, God-centered, constitutional government. And I will fight to stop all of this. There are about 66 to 86 real conservative Republicans in the U.S. House. If these people get help, and if they get enough people around the country from here and other places to join them in 2012, then none of this stuff can happen unless they say it's okay. They can stop these things. And drastic action is needed. We may have to shut the government down. We may have to stop raising the debt ceiling in order to force government to cut back. I'm willing to do that. And if that's what you want, come and help me on March the 13th. Tell your friends and tell your neighbors to help Henry Ross to get to the U.S. Congress to get us back to the government of our founders. We have a short window of time, but I believe it can be done. I want to thank you for dropping by as you campaign throughout the district. We appreciate it. Thank you, Ann. It's good to be here with you.